thrilled uh, to be here just because what you all are doing in practice, focusing on details, is a spiritual truth of our country. You know, we can be Democrats and Republicans, but most Americans are patriots. For over a decade now, good ideas have emanated from the BPC. Thank you for convening this very impressive group of, of thought leaders. Your organization has brought together leaders from across our society to advocate for common sense solutions to our most challenging problems. Because if it's bipartisan, it's much more likely to pass. When you have people philosophically and ideologically in two different worlds, and they put them together on a committee, that committee usually is not very productive. Once we get staffs blending, and John and I, they know that the members are friends and we talk, things can happen. Thank you, Anand, for that introduction, and to the BPC for its important efforts. Thank the bipartisan policy uh, center. You, you guys are great. I have, uh, we all have bipartisan responsibilities to this nation to defend principles that have long made America the beacon of hope. It's going to take all of us to try to turn down the temperature and really focus on what unites us. Welcome. I'm John Surishan, the Senior Associate Director for Business and Technology at the Bipartisan Policy Center. From online search engines to product recommendation systems, digitization and tech platforms have changed the nature of commerce. Over the last year, BPC has been hosting a series of events on big tech and competition policy. For our discussion today, we're going to focus on the online practices uh, that we see today, such as self-referencing, restrictions on sideloading, and data usage. Uh, we have an expert panel to talk about these issues, so let me introduce them. Uh, first, we have Alden Abbott. He is a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center. Hi, Alden. Hello. Uh, next, we have uh, Bill Baer, who is a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institution. Welcome, Bill. Bill. Thank you. Uh, and next we have Ashley Baker. She is the Director of Public Policy at the Committee for Justice. Uh, thanks for joining us, Ashley. Thank you. And finally, uh, last but not least, uh, we have uh, Diana Moss, who is the President of the American Antitrust Institute. Welcome, Diana. Thanks, John. Uh, so thank you all for joining us. Uh, before we begin, though, I want to let the audience know that you can ask questions by using the live chat function on YouTube or via Twitter using the hashtag BPC Live. Again, that's the hashtag uh, BPC Live. Uh, with that, let me start with my first question, which is directed at Ashley. Uh, the internet and digitization have had considerable effects on business and commerce with several trillion dollar companies emerging in this environment, many that are household names uh, like Apple and Google. Uh, new practices and tools such as sort of search engines, which we mentioned, and recommendation systems on online marketplaces have also emerged. Uh, given this context, do you think it makes sense to review our existing antitrust laws and competition policy? Uh, thanks, John, and thank you for having me here. And that's a great and very relevant question right now. And I think, so, so kind of going back to, to the framing of your question, you, you say several trillion dollar companies and um, people like to just generally point to sector level concentration going up and think of that as mm -hmm. um, evidence of some sort of systemic failure to enforce antitrust laws. And I, I think, you know, as broadly speaking, like from a you know 30,000 foot level, I think that that's neither really here nor there when it comes to whether or not competition is increasing or decreasing um, and whether or not these certain behaviors are anti-competitive or not. Um, and I think the broader debate, though, has focused less on you know, the specific behaviors of, the, I mean, it has, you know, more recently in the legislative debate um, on the specific behaviors of the platforms, but more generally, um, it's been this question of should we move back to antitrust law that fulfills different objectives that are not um, necessarily competition related. So, so that's kind of, you know, the broader framing here that we're working with. In terms of reform, though, I, I do think that periodic review and reform of these, I mean, that's always a good thing. And I do think there's a lot of room for improvement when it comes to things such such as um, how agencies um, enforce antitrust, um, adding some jurisdictional clarity. There's something called the Smarter Act a few um, years ago that I, I thought had some um, great, great ideas in it in terms of um, how to better allocate things at agencies. Um, there, there, there are several ways to reform the process, but in terms of what the antitrust law is more broadly, I don't think that this necessarily presents that unique of a challenge. 
All right, thank you, Ashley, for that uh, framing and response. I'm gonna bring Bill into this conversation and let's focus on a specific online practice that a lot of people are talking about. So the issue of self-preference thing is a major focus of the American Innovation and Choice Online Act. Uh, so this is a multi-part question. So first, can you explain what self-referencing is exactly and whether you have concerns about it? Uh, how does existing law sort of handle this issue, both on and offline? Uh, and is new legislation appropriate given uh, this sort of like context? Uh, and if you can touch on also issues of privacy, security, and content moderation that come up in these debates, uh, we would appreciate that as well. All right, John, that's bigger than a traditional Thanksgiving <laughs> meal. Let me see what I can uh, uh, get at there. Um, I'll take a stab at addressing things. I do have a blog post on the Brookings uh, website that talks about how S2992, the Senate version uh, of the bill, uh, would work. But first, what's the problem that people perceive? Uh, the problem is that we've got a number of large digital platforms that appear to have both acquired and successfully maintained market powers. These are the gatekeepers. There are many reasons why this has happened. There are network effects. Once you get to a certain level of, of users, people uh, are sticky, reluctant to go elsewhere. There's the tendency of, uh, as a result of those platform markets to tip in favor of just one firm. Uh, there are allegations that, that some of these successful firms uh, are acquiring potential rivals or otherwise limiting their growth by locking in customers and advertisers and hoarding the personal data that the platforms acquire. As I think everybody knows, that's the price we as consumers pay to be on these platforms at general. We don't pay any money. We pay with, uh, uh, with our data. Uh, that's not money, but it's costly. And that's part of the concern. Now, the issue you've raised uh, involves the demonstrated ability of these big platforms to preference their own products or services uh, over the services and products of third parties. So you think of Amazon highlighting its, its uh, store brands. And the concern is that their control of the platform enables them to reinforce their dominance on the platform and potentially allows for these firms to leverage themselves uh, into other markets. So the bill S2992 in the house version make it unlawful for these dominant platforms of a certain size to prefer their own products and services, to limit the ability of others to, uh, uh, to compete against the products and services provided by a platform operator. They can't discriminate under this uh, proposed law in terms of service, interoperability, placement. They can't hoard access to consumer data uh, just to the platform owner. Uh, and they can't uh, bias search by users of the, of the platform. Now, it's important to note these prohibitions are actually not outright bans. That's contrary to some of the claims being made by the opponents of the legislation. Uh, uh, you would need to show or, or an element of determining whether or not somebody has violated this law is a showing that there's material harm to competition. Uh, a platform can also defend on other, uh, on other grounds that it, privacy, national security, cybersecurity concerns warrant these restrictions. You also asked whether um, self-preferencing can today be an antitrust violations. And under certain, certain circumstances, it can. For the most part, self-preferencing by a firm without market power is benign. And in fact, it's often counterproductive. I don't know if people have read the stories about Bed Bath & Beyond with a new chairman and CEO came in and decided to focus on, um, on store brands. And uh, the strategy failed <laughs> miserably. That's not what consumers wanted. The challenge here is uh, that, um, uh, that these platforms seem to be quite successful at remaining dominant. And therefore, there isn't the ability, unlike Bed Bath & Beyond, for somebody easily to move elsewhere. That gives the platform uh, power. So bottom line is what S2992 does, it directs the antitrust enforcers to be particularly vigilant 
in this space to develop guidelines so the companies know what the rules of the road are, uh, are, are going to be. Final thing uh, you asked about, I think, was uh, uh, content moderation uh, and whether uh, this bill legitimately raises a concern about limiting a platform's ability to engage in content moderation. I know some opponents of the bill say it does. I just don't see that. If you have a neutrally applied policy on content moderation, somebody violates that policy, you kick them off. Um, uh, it's hard to see that that is in any way a violation of any of the provisions uh, of the bill. And uh, it's hard to see that there actually can be a showing of material harm to competition. So with that, I'll turn it back to you. Great, thank you, Bill. Yeah, you gave a lot for us to chew on and sorry if the question was <laughs> on the longer end, I promise I'll keep it shorter next. Uh, an issue you raised with some of the exceptions to the uh, bill, the S2992 bill, uh, and this kind of gets us to the question of affirmative defenses, as I believe uh, they're sort of called. Uh, so on that matter, I'm going to turn to Diana. Can you sort of elaborate a bit more on this idea of affirmative defenses? Uh, and how we should think about affirmative defenses, whether it's S in S2992 or other uh, areas of competition policy as it pertains to big tech or even, even broader than that. Sure, thanks, John. And thanks for having me on the program. Uh, always a pleasure. Um, I, I think the affirmative defenses uh, component of uh, uh, 2992, but also 2710, which is Senator Blumenthal's open app market bill, and other forms of legislation that really create new antitrust authorities um, to address market power problems in the digital sector. Um, I, I think that's where the rubber is gonna meet the road <clears throat> because uh, going this route, uh, 2992, 2710, which I think is an important route, we need stronger antitrust enforcement. Uh, we need very much a public policy approach to the digital tech sector, which might also include something like a sector regulator, as I'll talk about um, uh, later, um, means that a lot of these litigated uh, issues will end up in the courts. That's where antitrust always ends up. And so that is the wheels of antitrust turn slowly and uh, cases take a while to work through the system. But one of the um, major uh, issues that has arisen in, in the last 30, 40 years of weak enforcement is is what we call burden shifting, which is once the, the plaintiff uh, has made the case for uh, anti-competitive effect, the burden then shifts to the defendants to justify their conduct, their otherwise anti-competitive conduct. And um, we've seen uh, a very high burden on plaintiffs and a very low burden on defendants to, to justify anti-competitive conduct. Both the bills, 2992 and 2710, do include language on affirmative defenses. And those, um, those defenses generally circulate around um, privacy of uh, user data, security of user data, uh, safety of participation in an ecosystem, uh, prevention of, spa of, of, of fraud or spam, uh, or something that would, uh, a, a, con a type of conduct that would interfere with maintaining the core functionality of the platform. All of this is to say, that these affirmative defenses that defendants, the platforms can offer up uh, as justification for why they engaged in uh, suspicious conduct or, or uh, anti-competitive conduct, um, those are gonna be relied on heavily by defendants. They're gonna come in with very sophisticated arguments about why the, the behavior was necessary to justify, uh, um, was justified by privacy issues, security issues, core functionality of the platform issues. Um, these are highly technical issues that I think judges are going to really struggle with, right? Judges struggle with very basic issues invo involving burden shifting uh, in antitrust cases like mergers uh, around things like, well, the merger will allow us to coordinate better. The merger will reduce our costs. Uh, it'll produce all these pro-competitive effects. That's a whole different ball of wax than the very technical engineering uh, um, uh, defenses that we're going to see pop up in these types of cases under 2992 and 2710. So um, we will be watching very carefully um, to see how judges and courts deal with these, um, these defenses around privacy and security and core functionality of the platform. 
Um, I, as I said, that is where the rubber will meet the road. Um, it is uh, all of that said, um, this is, these bills are a form of much stronger antitrust enforcement, um, but uh, uh, we will see how these cases play out and how judges are going to deal with this burden shifting framework and the very complex technical arguments that defendants provide them to justify their conduct. Thank you, Diana. And I'm going to see if Alden wants to get into this uh, discussion right now. So Alden, correct me if I'm wrong, you were the general counsel at the FTC. So how the courts will react to these uh, laws would be something you probably have uh, thought of. So do you want to respond to either uh, Diana's comments or sort of your thoughts on the self-preferencing issue or uh, something else that was brought up earlier in the discussion? Right. Well, well, thanks for that, John. Yes. A self-preferencing, and Bill sort of indicated too, is actually ubiquitous business practice. It's everything from the placement of store brands uh, by, by a major supermarket to uh, selling rights at favorable placements to certain uh, private parties. Uh, now, the claim that by having general bans on self-preferencing subject to defenses, and as Diana has pointed out, it's going to take years for, the, I think, the courts to untangle these defenses. There's also least, least restrictive means language, other language. And there, if you have a legislative history saying, well, you're trying to help individual competitors rather than competition, which is the history of antitrust, you're going to have huge costs. And that's going to deter improvements, I think, in, and, and not lots of scholars, not just I, but uh, in from uh, people like Eric Hovenkamp, of people like Rich Gilbert, former chief economist uh, at the Antitrust Division in the Clinton administration, people like Doug Melamed, former acting assistant attorney general for antitrust in the Clinton administration. They're very concerned that all this ambiguity of language uh, is going to create disincentives to improve platforms. If you don't, uh, as, as some economists have pointed out, and another person I could might mention, Michael Sat Salinger, former chief economist, if you create disincentives to improving platforms, you're going to create uh, a degradation, a slowdown in the rate of improvement. And there's this presumption that there's a lack of competition. Well, the fact is there are, lot, there are lots of companies that have access to these platforms, even if, say, Amazon is seemingly uh, preferring certain uh, complementary brands. It doesn't prevent people. I, and I know lots of other people, I go on to Amazon Prime, but find lots of things not offered by Amazon Prime. These are outlets and new and businesses which never had the opportunity to reach tens of millions of consumers before. They've had a huge benefit from Amazon. So, so what if Amazon gives perhaps more favorable preference upfront, seeming to, to favorite products? It's not, it's just a slight slide down the page or a click or two to find other options. And by the way, as I say, these other businesses are given opportunities by the very existence of the platform that they didn't have before. And if you start disincentivizing and adding huge uncertain litigation costs uh, facing the large platforms, they're gonna, their product going forward isn't gonna be great. And who, who was harmed its consumers? There's studies, there's, there's huge amounts of consumer welfare that are created by the uh, availability to access the platforms, uh, which is not measured uh, in advertising revenues. It's well above the advertising and other revenues generated by the platforms. So I think uh, it's a real, uh, you, we can't predict with any certainty, but there's a real Pandora's box of risks and disincentives to improvements in the platforms uh, generated by this self-preferencing language which is new, which is going to lead to endless litigation. I, I know for the FTC has certainly seen that. We thought uh, a simple term like permanent injunction, we thought would allow um, uh, us to get, when I was at the FTC, to get consumer uh, financial relief. Uh, Supreme Court said no. And, and it's going to take Supreme Court decisions. They're going to take many years. Meanwhile, businesses are going to have in their SEC reports, I'm going to have to note, the risks of this litigation, and they're going to they're going to be more cautious about innovating. This is so. So I would think carefully about that. Can I just make a couple of quick points in response, John? Ahead, uh, sure. Alden, as he always does, 
articulately summarizes, uh, uh, you know, the, the reasons why uh, he's concerned about uh, about this particular bill. But but a, a couple of things. First of all, the bill does require the FTC and the DOJ to provide guidance similar to the merger guidelines, which will help with some of the implementation uh, challenges. Second, there's no private right of action. So if there's going to be litigation, it's going to come from the FTC, the DOJ, or state attorneys general. So it, it, it is focused. And any company will have the, the opportunity to come in and convince the potential enforcement agency, the potential enforcer, that, uh, that they satisfy uh, the conditions, the exceptions, the affirmative defenses. And I don't think the agencies are going to go willy-nilly into court where, uh, where they think they've heard a meritorious argument. So the, the day-to-day impact, uh, in my view, uh, is likely to be quite less on business behavior than, uh, than the way Alden has just uh, uh, suggested. Okay, and I think Diana wants to get in on the conversation. So does Ashley. So I'll let you guys jump in. Just one quick question as someone who has less experience in antitrust than the panel, which has more than, you know, maybe a century of experience combined. Uh, <laughs> I, I have half of it. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, guidelines right now, could the DOJ and FTC put out guidelines uh, around self-referencing under existing laws, or would that not be something? They, they can do that, Bill. Okay. Yes, Okay, uh, with that, let me let Diana sort of react to everything that was just said and then give Ashley a chance to do the same. Yeah, I just want to respond, um, push back a little bit on something Alden mentioned about how um, 2992 or other, um, you know, other forms of constraints on self-preferencing would adversely affect the pathway of innovation by the large digital platforms. So as I'm an economist, Um, There is a huge body of literature out there that specifically addresses innovation pathways um, based on market structures, right? How does innovation evolve when you have a competitive market? How does innovation evolve when you have a market dominated by a monopoly or an oligopoly? And and the bottom line is that uh, monopolies, dominant firms and oligopolies innovate in very different ways that we see uh, in in more competitive markets. They will innovate in ways to protect their monopoly, to protect their tight oligopoly. They will refuse to cannibalize their own sales uh, through distorted innovation pathways. Um, In other words, the the, the innovation you get from uh, in markets that are dominated, uh, that are not competitive and dominated by dominant firms and oligopolies is absolutely not what you would get under more competitive market circumstances. And if you do uh, open up a a level playing field for access to platforms by third party vendors and rivals, then then you open up pathways for them to innovate in socially optimal ways uh, by not being discriminated against and iced out by the platform and that sort of thing. So I I just wanna chime in that this is a very important uh, body of economic literature that supports um, that supports the importance of competition in innovation. Diana, would I be fair to say you're sort of making this uh, dichotomy between pro-competitive and anti-competitive innovation uh, regarding uh, yeah, yeah. terms of the market power? Yeah, you could you could characterize it that way, John. Okay. Um, I, yeah, just very very different incentives. Incentives are really at the core here, uh, uh, and very different outcomes. Thank you. Uh, and with that, let me let Ashley sort of uh, give her take. Uh, so, Ashley? Yeah, so I wanted to expand upon a point that, that Alden raised, I think just doesn't get enough attention in this debate. And that's, um, where is the harm? And that's what I think a lot of people are are thinking when they're looking at this bill more broadly. And I think it's also you know where a lot of judges will start to, to think when going through these cases too. But like, where is the consumer harm? Because competing with your competitor, companies have innovated to outcompete each other for centuries. Um, that is how that works. But I, I just don't like this approach to per se illegality. I think that if you were to say, okay, product preferencing is bad, no matter what company does it, it harms consumers. Here's evidence that product preferencing harms consumers, no matter who does it, and then ban it for every company. I would probably disagree pretty strongly with that conclusion, but I think that would be a correct approach. Um, and I, I don't think it makes any sense um, just as an approach to per se illegality and about behaviors. And I think another part of the bill that's underlooked is I, I think the in the amended version made it 10% of revenue as a penalty and not 15%. Either way, 
all that has to be done is another competitor launches a complaint and then there's the fear of losing 10 percent of revenue and that that's very very significant a, a agency can really get a company to comply or agree with pretty much anything if that's the potential end result. I think it does create this dynamic between the agencies and those who are being accused that um, is a bit more than tilted. Thank you, Ashley. Um, I wanna let uh, you, if, I'll say you raise your hand, I'll let you respond to those comments. I'm gonna also ask another question, which I think has been sort of brought up earlier. Uh, so many of the bills, not just the uh, S2992 bill, which we've talked a lot about, but some of the other bills have uh, sort of targeted platforms based on their size in terms of market capitalization and user base. Uh, do you support this approach? Uh, and what do you think the long-term effect of this approach uh, would be? Well, I, I uh, thanks, thanks, John. I think it's very problematic. It's inconsistent with the history of the antitrust where there have been uh, principles found in the major statute, the Sherman Act, Clayton Act, which have been neutral uh, as to size. And that there's a convoluted set of definitions, sales, you know, one time in the last year, it, it's it really very convoluted. And it seems, well, in reality, just aimed, you know, at, at certain, you know, Amazon, uh, uh, Google, uh, Facebook, Apple, but Microsoft might also be covered. But the reality is that lots of firms are could be with the growth of the economy and uh, devaluation of currency could surpass those thresholds. Uh, the larger firms might take steps to fall under some of the thresholds. And because of a huge amount of liability they face, a huge percentage of, of turnover, they'd have incentive to do that. So it, it incentivizes gamesmanship to try and avoid being covered by the definition. So firms are going to worry, how can I uh, restrict my, my uh, uh, number of consumers who log on or my sales and measured in some way so as not to be covered? Or how can I, and, and this is extremely arbitrary, the idea that businesses should be focused on, I think, uh, growing and uh, innovating new products. Again, it, and we can get into a big discussion of innovation. I think there's some economists, frankly, who wouldn't exactly 100% agree with what Diana had to say, but that's a separate conversation. I mean, I think there, the amount of innovation is not necessarily a perfect competition and monopoly between that, somewhere in between. There's sometimes called a U-shaped curve, but, but whatever, I think it's very, very deleterious to create these incentives for gamesmanship. And it, in effect, in some ways, I think it, it offends the rule of law and it, it becomes a, almost a form of regulation. In the past, antitrust has tried to avoid that because there's a whole history of regulation uh, and applying special rules to special companies, say common carriers, that in communications and other areas has, has uh, retarded innovation and created incentives that dominant companies to use a regulator to, to slow innovation. So anyway, I think this is a mess uh, if, if, you're, if you want to change principles, I don't agree with it, but self-preferencing preferencing something else, don't establish these arbitrary uh, caps because it makes it, it that in, its, in and of itself uh, works mischief. Okay, I see Bill has his hand up. So Bill, do you want to react to that? And then so Diana just a, and then a, Ashley. A couple of uh, uh, very quick points. One is, uh, you know, I... Uh, Ashley's correct that the bill as 2992 does list 10 things that are prohibited, but they're not per se unlawful. They're subject to all sorts of burdens on the government and affirmative defenses. So uh, per se is probably not the most precise way of, of describing it. A second point is the, the legislation says that the monetary penalty can be, can be imposed is, is to be that which is sufficient to deter uh, repetition of the conduct up to 10% of the revenue of the company. And, uh, you know, we are not going to get into 10% uh, revenue fines. Yeah, that's sufficient to defer to deter language is quite meaningful in terms of focusing the amount of penalty on the severity of 
the behavior that violates the proposed law uh, and, and, uh, and whatever is sufficient to convince the company that it's got to stay away from that. Thanks, Bill. And uh, Diana, you're next and then Ashley. Yeah, I just want to, I want to just dovetail a little bit with what Alden was talking about in terms of the, the market cap thresholds uh, to be, to be considered a covered platform. I, I actually would go the other way. Um, there are a lot of digital business, uh, digital business ecosystems out there that are hovering below the cap in terms of um, market value. Um, and AI just did a big report earlier in the year where we looked at the up and coming players, right? The, the next generation of big digital ecosystems Firms like Salesforce and Salesforce and Intuit and Adobe and, and others that uh, might be more niche market oriented as opposed to, you know, search platforms or e-commerce platforms, but uh, they operate in healthcare or they work operate in fintech. Um, these platforms have been highly acquisitive, extremely active. Their market value is increasing. Um, they are really the next generation of digital, digital platforms that could eventually become covered platforms. But the bottom line is for right now, right now, for right now, right here, um, it doesn't really matter what size uh, of company we're talking about. There are some uh, very sophisticated, acquisitive, powerful uh, digital business, uh, digital businesses out there that, that absolutely would have incentives to disadvantage rivals operating on their platforms but they're not covered and uh, under the current construction of, of the law. So I, I would actually, as I said, go in the other direction. Mar market cap thresholds don't really matter. What matters is, um, you know, what is the position of the firm in a well-defined market, right? What, is the, what are the firm's incentives for exercising market power um, of unilaterally or in a coordinated way? Um, we need to get to those basic antitrust questions that are asked in investigations. What are the abilities? What are the incentives to exercise market power? And a, a, a well-crafted regulatory system of sector regulation, uh, which would ideally complement what's going on with 2992 and 2710, would, you know, would throw the umbrella using appropriately defined criteria to what types of conducts conduct and 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 uh, companies that these rules would apply to so you know it's almost like you don't really need market cap thresholds you need a you you need more of a functional description of how companies operate uh you know what their size is what behaviors they engage in what are their incentives for exercising market power i think that's really what we should be getting at here in 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 um, developing policy solutions Thanks, Diana. Uh, and we'll probably dive into the sector specific regulator question soon. Uh, but with that, I want to turn it to uh, Ashley. And Ashley, uh, Diana did mention this idea of a next generation ecosystem. So there's many companies uh, that we're not talking about as much, and even some companies that don't exist that future, you know, uh, antitrust regulators will be thinking about. Uh, so do you want to react to what others have said uh, and maybe even uh, emphasize a bit more on this next generation question of uh, digital uh, platforms? Sure, thank you. Uh, when, when it comes to the next, I mean, it, it depends. I mean, there are a lot of emerging technologies. There are a lot, of, and as you said, some of these have not been imagined yet. Some of these companies don't exist yet. So it's really kind of hard to go there. I, I don't really like dealing in, in those sorts of specific hypotheticals. I was going to kind of go back though to um, point out something which is more, broadly relevant though to a sector specific regulation and that having giving agencies the authority to designate um, companies as covered entities after this has passed is a bad way of going about sector specific regulation and if we look then there are examples of this for example under dodd frank fsoc was um, tasked with identifying what companies were um, a systemically important financial institution that was meant to target large banks but then that ended up um in metlife and ge ended up being you know sifis under um fsoc designation is four and a half years of litigation later metlife which is an insurer finally got that designation removed. So I think there are lots of ways in which this can not go as planned as well. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, and I want to actually give the next question to Diana, just building up this sector specific uh, regulation idea. Uh, so 
again, you've called for this uh, in the past and you sort of referenced this just right now. Uh, can you tell us what a sector specific regulator uh, in the context of digital platforms would actually mean in practice? Uh, and you can elaborate further on why you uh, think it's a necessary idea. Sure. So I would I would just uh, for those of you who might not know, Senator Michael Bennett from my home state of Colorado has introduced a bill uh, which actually would set up a, a sector regulator for digital technology. It would it would have broad uh, functions and authorities, including privacy, but also market power issues and content moderation issues. Um, so we actually did get a first initial legislative proposal that at least broaches the idea of a dedicated sector regulator. But let me turn to, and, and that would ideally work very much in complement with, or uh, would complement uh, efforts to uh, strengthen and enforce the antitrust laws in this, in this particular sector. Um, but, but the reason for a sector regulator is this, and again, AAI has done a, yet another study on digital tech really looking at the business model, the digital business ecosystem model, it's really quite unique in, as compared to more traditional manufacturing based uh, business models. What we see is, uh, is zero price markets, right? Yeah, consumers don't pay with currency, they pay with their, their, their attention and their, their clicks and their data. Um, we see lots of economic um, uh, anomalies like huge scale economies and cloud infrastructure, right? We also see an enormous number of market failures. Bill alluded to the big one earlier, network effects, meaning the more uh, users you see on a platform, like a social media platform, the more valuable it becomes to everybody. But we also see other market failures like asymmetries in uh, information about how consumers provide their data. And consumers are, very, are notorious for saying, look, I value my privacy as I interact with a digital business uh, ecosystem, but then they don't act in ways that actually reflect their privacy preferences. So that's that's a market failure as as well. And the list goes on. So these are very complex economic entities, these digital business ecosystems, which consist of a platform, cloud infrastructure, and uh, an ecosystem or a constellation of, of applications, right? And, and so uh, on top of that, we have a very complex uh, way of, of, creating, of creating value in the ecosystem, and that is through algorithmic preference shape, shaping, correct? So uh, that's why we see all this investment in cloud. That's why we see a huge market concentration in cloud technology right now with Amazon with 33% of the market and Google buying Looker back in 2019 and Microsoft as number two in cloud. Um, that is the name of the game. That is the engine of the ecosystem, which is to take user data, to enrich it, to harness the value of it. Uh, it's all part of the value proposition. And most of that, and, and, and that, that, that algorithmic preference shaping can be used to steer users to preferred products and services. That is self-preferencing. Unfortunately, none of that is referenced in any legislative proposal. Um, and again, this goes to my earlier point about judges getting their heads wrapped around algorithms and how are algorithms constructed to, to be biased or to be, to, to be self-preferenced. Um, that is really the kernel, the core of, of the problem here that really recommends, given the complexity, given the ability to look into algorithms or not, right? First Amendment issues potentially that really goes to the recommendation that we need a dedicated, technically expert sector regulator that has the ability to unpack these complex economic engineering issues um, and, and to work alongside of stronger antitrust enforcement uh, in the sector. It also goes to the fact that the, po the point I made earlier, which is it doesn't matter what market cap you are, it's the incentives for the company uh, the firm to engage in anti-competitive behavior. And an open access regime, much like at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, I was there in the, in the early 90s working on the open access rule, much like in, in, at the FCC, telecommunications. These types of open access regimes are typically developed by sector regulators and, and enforced by sector regulators. And yes, it is all, you know, decisions are appealable in federal court, but it is done through rulemaking and it is done through a very careful studied process that involves lawyers, economists, engineers, technologists. It, it, it is not thrown into the courts 
to have judges wind their way through these very, very difficult um, complexities and economic, unique economic characteristics. Great. Thanks, Diana. And I know uh, uh, Alden wants to respond to that, and I'll give everyone else a chance to respond to the sector-specific regulator question if they want, but Alden, I'll, I'll let you react. Well, uh, that was a very <clears throat> eloquent description of regulation and the complexities and so on that attend uh, these industries, but uh, it ignores a long history of regulation. There are a number of problems with, with sector-specific regulation, and indeed, which problems which have been avoided by antitrust in the past. First of all, there's a tendency of capture, as George Stigler pointed out. Often dominant regulated firm, AT&T, for example, deterred and uh, uh, used its regulated status to help uh, slow down innovations such as cellular, uh, uh, the spread of cellular technologies and, and, and cable television and then manipulated a commission. Uh, with the best of intentions, regulators have a history of being manipulated. Uh, so that, that, that's a real problem. And indeed, particularly if you're going to spread the regulation to the entire digital sector, the dominant firm often is in precisely the best situation to use its, its, its huge fixed base of lawyers and experts in effect to, uh, to uh, harm and disadvantage potential entrants. I think that's why uh, the, the chairman of uh, then Facebook uh, uh, said a couple of years ago that he welcomed regulation. Yes, welcomed regulation because that could in effect entrench the monopoly power of, of Facebook. And if you look at attempts to regulate, for instance, privacy in Europe, uh, digital um, and GDPR, privacy regulation is actually entrenched and increased the market power, for example, of Google, because of the burden of these privacy regulations have been too high for lots of potential entrants. And I think uh, there, there are all sorts of, Hayek pointed out the pretense of knowledge of government bureaucrats with the best of intentions, they don't have the information and cannot, uh, that flows naturally and changes instantaneously through market processes. The more, there's also the possibility of corruption, but totally apart from that, as I say, that I think regulatory culture with a few perhaps rare exceptions is incompatible with innovation. So if you really want to slow down innovation, and note that Europe, which has a much more regulatory cult culture, not one of the 20 major digital platforms was formed there. Uh, Europeans are moving towards, towards uh, ha heavier regulation, more power to them. I don't think that's going to improve their record at all. So I think that the, the very worst thing that one could do is set up a, a new regulatory body. Not to mention there would be tensions between uh, the FTC, between other regulators, uh, uh, Consumer Financial Protection Board, there'd be bureaucratic squabbling. So, yeah, and the idea of dispassionate experts who can solve these problems, I think with the best of intentions, I, I appreciate that, but I think it's awfully naive and inconsistent with history. Okay, thank you for that reaction, Alden. I wanna see if Bill or Ashley want to jump in on this question or should we move on to the next topic? Just a, just a quick reaction to some of what Alden said. I, these concerns, I, I would not reject out of hand. Um, that is, it would be a, a, a big transition to have a regulatory uh, agency focused on the tech sector. But as I, I think it was Diana said very early on, you know, there seem to be unique market characteristics to this sector, externalities that include privacy violations and other things, uh, and a, a, a pace of technological change that it's very hard using traditional antitrust tools, uh, uh, um, uh, traditional privacy uh, rules to keep up with it. So to have a body with, with true expertise uh, able to keep pace of these trends to look at where markets may be forming and then quickly tipping to have some rules to address that may be the best way to channel competition in, in the tech space. Uh, and just one quick other thought uh, uh, to Alden's last point, uh, you know, uh, the Direct Markets Act, uh, which just passed the European Parliament and will go into effect 
is sort of a hybrid model of antitrust enforcement, but also rulemaking uh, authority to, to deal with some of these characteristics that are unique to the technology sector. Thanks, Bill. And Ashley, do you want to react or should we move on to the next question? Um, we can move on to the next question. Okay, uh, next question is for Bill. Uh, so the issue of portability and interoperability uh, have come up as a sort of tool for sort of uh, promoting competition. And again, portability and interoperability are different, but they're often very intertwined. Uh, do you think uh, this is a good, and several bills are mandating, uh, sort of putting in place mandates around portability, interoperability for competition purposes. Uh, do you think mandates around portability, interoperability are a good idea? Uh, if so, under what circumstances? And do you think uh, legislation is necessary or could they uh, do things under existing laws using guidelines? I don't think you could get there under existing law to answer your uh, last question first. Uh, it's always tough because then I don't remember the other questions. But uh, uh, but uh, the uh, uh, I think as a policy matter, as a principled matter, theoretical matter, portability and interoperability are good ideas. Uh, we have some experience with them working. A lot of the people uh, uh, on this call uh, probably don't remember the time prior to 2003 when you could not port your phone, whether it be a landline or a mobile phone. The FCC set up a rule to do that. But in talking to people there involved in it, uh, uh, the technical challenges of, of ensuring interoperability and portability were huge, but the benefits were even, were even greater. So I, I don't think we should underestimate the challenges, but uh, we also should not overlook the benefits. Uh, uh, we have, as I've said before, in the tech space, this tendency for markets to tip and one firm to be, to be powerful. And, and, and necessary for me as a consumer, necessary for uh, people who are selling or advertising on the platform to have, and it's very hard, it's a sticky platform. It's very hard for me to move uh, uh, elsewhere. And if we had rules governing portability and interoperability, that would facilitate competition. It would deal with the stickiness of these uh, tech platforms. Uh, it's going to be tough to get from here to there, but I think it's a legitimate public policy goal and it's fully consistent with principles of promoting competition. Thanks, Phil. And does anyone else want to react to the portability interoperability question? Also, I'm going to throw in privacy uh, as an issue, the interaction of privacy with competition policy and portability interoperability. I think, Diana, you had your hand raised. Is that correct? Sure, sure. So in? I, I want to, I want to second what Bill just said about portability and in, in interoperability. These are all important, what I would call access goals, right? And and this is really a, a selling point for a digital markets regulator, as opposed to asking anti tasking antitrust uh, with promoting these these um, um, promoting these goals. Uh, and, and I'd have to go back and read the, the Bennett bill, but, but uh, aside from the Bennett bill, in theory, a digital market regulator could address interoperability, data portability, uh, a treatment of user data and privacy around interaction with the digital ecosystems, absolutely could address discrimination, self-preferencing, whatever you want to call, whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, to, to get at, uh, to limit the exercise of market power. Um, this is a broad mandate for a dedicated sector regulator. And, and the nice thing about a sector regulator is you have a conglomeration of experience and expertise in a sector regulator that, that works together in a coordinated way. And, and then more broadly, a sector regulator would work in a coordinated way with antitrust uh, authorities. I used to do this when I was at FERC. I was a liaison between the commission and the DOJ and the FTC and DOE. And on these big policy issues of creating the level playing field, um, an open access system, rules of the road on who's, how, how market participants will operate on these platforms, um, that made for a very collaborative 
very productive, good public policy approach. So all of this is could easily fall under the rubric or the, the, the authority of a dedicated sector regulator. And I just want to point out that we're not talking about public utility regulation here. We're not talking about prices and profit and entry control. We're talking about access and level creating a level playing field for market participants. That is not a very invasive form of regulation. And I think the debate in the United States over regulation, which of course the GOP does not support, um, really should be clarified to, to emphasize, this is not public utility regulation. This is a different form of level playing field regulation. Thanks, Diana. Uh, Alden, I think you wanted to react if I uh, saw your hand correctly. Oh. Uh, and I want to sort of add a question uh, on top of everything that was said. Uh, you're a big proponent of the consumer welfare standard for antitrust. Uh, what are your thoughts or what do you want to say to people who think that uh, the consumer welfare standard should either be uh, modified or replaced uh, in this current environment? Yeah. So react to what people have said right, on the right. consumer welfare question. Well, first of all, I, thank you, uh, John. I mean, I, I, I understand the people in principle interoperability if done voluntarily and if driven by markets can be helpful, but it does have costs. And there are, the way the bill is written, uh, the bills are written, in my view, some real security risks, some real privacy risks. And then it's sort of beyond the scope of what, what we have time for, but there's some real risks to privacy interests. Uh, and uh, also to national security, their interest, very frankly, if you're, if you're guaranteeing, I'm looking at some of this language, uh, uh, for a, we do not restrict or impede the capacity of a business user to access or interoperate with the same platform operating system, hardware, software features that are available to the covered platform operating his own products or services or lines of business. It could, in a way, lead to penetration of, 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 of a particular database and, and harm privacy. But, that, but more generally on consumer welfare, uh, the consumer welfare standard uh, it's a myth, it's just about price. No, it takes into account quality, innovation, uh, and the courts have said that the full panoply of things. Now, very frankly, huge amount of consumer welfare. And I'll mention very briefly an article about by Eric Brynjolfsson of MIT and Avinash Collis uh, that trying to measure, they measured hundreds of billions of dollars just created by Facebook in consumer welfare, net of any payments going to Facebook. And this is, a, I did this through, through sort of experiments with consumers telling them what, what would you pay to have these services? And actually in, in, in certain samples, actually paying uh, randomized uh, individuals to see what they would really pay for some of these preferences. Again, it's a new area, but they're saying, it's another reason why I'm concerned about throwing the consumer welfare standard out. Say, so, well, let's regulate the platforms, prevent uh, harm, which I think it could be harm to competitors, ignoring the fact that the, on their own, the platforms have created a substantial addition to GDP, which is not measured in the GDP statistics, which measures sales of goods. I think it's one of the big underreported benefits of platforms, the huge accretion of unmeasured uh, consumer welfare. Now, if you throw out the consumer welfare standard and you say, well, we're concerned about labor, harm to competitors, environmental cost, anti-discrimination, a bundle of factors as the current FTC chair has suggested, well, it sounds great, but basically violates the rule of law because it leaves it up to, to the administrator to decide which factor is going to be predominant in any particular case. And if it goes to the court, they say, what are, how are we supposed to decide this case? Uh, you know, it's hard enough uh, this, under con consumer welfare standards to decide cases when there are multiple factors, which, by the way, are not specifically mentioned in the statute. I think it, it, it's a cause of total confusion and would basically mean the antitrust laws are arbitrary uh, and are unadministrable, in my view. Alden, uh, thank you for that. And being very mindful of time, I'm gonna ask one uh, last question directed at Ashley, then give everyone a minute 
uh, for sort of a closing remark. But my question for Ashley uh, is, is there any issue uh, related to online practices that you think we either didn't cover or you just want to opine on, um, whether it's privacy or uh, restrictions on side loading or, or some other topic? Sure, I mean, there, there are a lot of a lot of different different online practices. Um, I suppose we could cover if we had, I suppose, a week to do this panel. But in, in terms of privacy, though, I, I would add that I think so. I do agree with Bill that hypothetically it could be a good idea to have interoperability or portability. Now, those ideas are worth exploring and getting from A to B there is really difficult. But I also think that we really need to have a federal privacy bill first, um, of course getting Congress to pass legislation is a little bit um, difficult. This is something they've gone back and forth on for the past 10 years. But I, I do think that's really important. There's also lingering with S-292, for example, the way that it's written, there are lingering questions too of liability. I mean, if you're on the receiving end of that, are you suddenly a process under a certain state's data laws? Um, how exactly would that work? There are a lot of open questions that could be taken care of better by a federal privacy law. Great. Thanks, Ashley. Okay. Uh, being very mindful of time, and I'm going to keep you all to a minute. Uh, last question for everyone. Uh, is there anything uh, you want to say about any of the specific bills or a general message you want to give uh, to policymakers? And this is just uh, in a minute or less. Uh, and I can start with uh, whoever wants, if you want to raise your hand. If not, I will uh, pick on Alden first. Okay. Thanks, John. Uh, I think first, do no harm. The Hippocratic Oath. Uh, what you have in, in the various bills, I'm not doubting the good intentions of the drafters, but you have a load of new provisions, which are, in my view, highly regulatory in nature, some of them anyway, and which depart from the tradition of antitrust. Uh, and without any careful economic consideration, uh, the idea of making a major stat change in the statutory structure of the antitrust doesn't is unjustified, particularly because I think a lot of the claims of diminished competition uh, and harm over the last few decades, there's a lot of contrary economic research suggesting that those are based on misapplication of data and so on. At the same time, we've had huge amounts of consumer welfare created in the new dig digital economy. So as, as establishing a bunch of hard to understand standards that are going to lead to confusion litigation is absolutely the worst thing you want to do at this point if you want to promote a strong digital economy. Thanks, Alden. Uh, Bill, I'll go to you next. Sure. I um, let me begin by um, by disagreeing uh, with with Alden about the consumer welfare standard. I do think it has not stood the test of time. We have had it's well documented in the economic literature dramatic increases in concentration in many sectors of the economy. You go from ocean shipping to agriculture, transportation, uh, and what we're talking about here, uh, dominant firms in the uh, platform space. The consumer welfare standard as applied by the courts has been narrow and, and narrowing uh, over time. Uh, Diana talked about this. Uh, there is, uh, almost a, a bias against, uh, uh, against enforcement, except in the most uh, demonstrable cases, mergers to monopoly, uh, for example. The, the part of the proponents of the consumer welfare standard, part of their philosophy is, as, as Alden said, is, is do no harm, avoid what we call type one errors. And that bias, I think, has led to, uh, uh, to practices that uh, uh, affect workers' wages, uh, increased monopsony power, failure to address uh, predatory pricing, uh, mergers that, uh, uh, that are approved that actually significantly restrict consumer choice. So I think whether you abandon the consumer welfare standard or modify it, which uh, uh, to direct the courts to be more supportive of antitrust challenges. And S2992, to, con to conclude my remarks, really would, would do that in this space by, uh, by including an element of material harm to competition, but identifying behaviors that are problematic, that if proven, 
uh, uh, the court should join. Thank you, Bill. Uh, and I'll turn it to Ashley next for your uh, closing remarks. Sure, thank you. So if I had one quick thing I guess to say to policymakers and lawmakers, it would be more so to take a step back. And, and I think it's worth asking, you know, what problem are you trying to solve here? And if you look at those who want to depart from the consumer welfare standard, the litany of concerns they want to solve with antitrust, it's, you know, it's everything from inequality to labor issues to uh, political donations or, you, you know, you name it. And there's some sort of antitrust related proposal that's been out there related to that thing. And I, I think that that's very problematic in that one area of the law, I can't possibly serve that many masters. And some of those things could be proposed legislatively differently, and I probably would not agree with that policy, but at least they'd be playing in the right court there, because I don't think that's antitrust. Thank you, Ashley. And Diane, I'll let you make your uh, closing remarks. Sure. Um, so just three quick points. Uh, one is, you know, looking back at how uh, the new legislation has evolved that that uh, is directed at the digital sector, the whole debate um, over digital tech, what's going on in Europe, what's happening here is re a really, really good example of what, what could have been a well-constructed public policy approach to addressing market power in the digital sector, um, which would really draw on multiple policy tools. And, you know, everybody's heard me say this, say this before. So that includes stronger antitrust enforcement, sector regulation, uh, stronger privacy law, et cetera. But I would also note that we need that approach in other sectors, right? So much energy is going into digital tech, um, but we, we see uh, incredible levels of concentration and abusive conduct in food and agriculture and in healthcare. All of these uh, problems that are, that are uh, uh, evidenced by rising concentration and, and other, other well-documented metrics really cry out for a public policy approach. So that's number one. Number two, stronger antitrust enforcement. Absolutely, 2992-2710 really are designed to work around the constraints on existing antitrust enforcement. Section two is not effective. We have not had many section two cases, monopolization cases. These bills were constructed specifically to create new law, new standards, uh, you know, new new burdens and, and uh, processes because we cannot get the enforcement we need out of Section 2. And frankly, haven't gotten it out of Section 7 either in terms of merger enforcement. Finally, um, I think all of this needs to be done with an eye to the future. All, of, all that is happening now is a look back on how the five largest platforms have gotten as big as they have. And they have done that by acquiring almost a thousand firms over the last 25 years. Uh, only one of which was challenged by uh, an antitrust agency, and that was Google ITA in 2009. Um, we need to be looking forward, as I said earlier, to the next generation of large digital platforms. How do they behave? What are their incentives? What are their abilities? And we need to really gear our, our public policy solution through antitrust, through privacy law, through regulation, to, um, to addressing those oncoming problems because they are absolutely coming at us. They're already here. They just don't meet the market caps of, of the current legislative proposals. All right, uh, thank you, Diana, Alden, Bill, and Ashley uh, for this sort of lively discussion uh, and joining us uh, for this event. Uh, I also wanna just quickly thank uh, Danielle Draper, uh, Emily Burns and our vendors for making this uh, event possible. I think it's been a fascinating discussion. Uh, finally, I want to thank the audience for watching uh, this event and uh, hope people can join us uh, next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, John.